Hi everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel, this is episode 167. Welcome back to returning viewers and welcome to new viewers. I hope that you find something here that you enjoy, that you are interested in. We are all about making yarn and using our hand spun yarns. As you can see, this is sort of a different format. So those who are watching the live stream, you can tell this is not really a live stream. This is obviously pre-recorded. The reason is because we wanted to try to get away throughout the fall um, for a couple of weekends, going camping, getting away from the house. And because the live streams are on the weekend, we sort of had to figure out a way that we could still get away and have that family time where I could join at the time of the live stream, but it meant that we could still get away. So we're gonna try a premiere, a YouTube premiere. So that's what you guys are watching right now. And I just hope that it goes well and that you guys enjoy the show. In today's show, we've still got a lot of the same stuff that we would normally have. Maybe the format will be a little bit different. Maybe things will sort of feel a little bit different. It'll sort of feel a little bit more like a pre-recorded podcast episode, kind of like what they used to be like, but let's give it a try and see how it goes. So without further ado, let's get into the show. show I wanted to talk about some of my projects I wanted to share with you a little bit about what's been going on I wanted to share with you a big mistake that I made this past week and thankfully um, I was able to rip everything out and it was all good but I wanted to share with a little bit about that and just kind of share some stuff that's been going on behind the scenes a little bit some stuff that's just been happening with my making some things I've been wondering about some things I've been thinking about and just sort of yeah, waxing a bit of poetic around sort of what I'm hoping my making will look like for the rest of the year. So a little bit of housekeeping because we do have to do a little bit of housekeeping. It just doesn't go away. The housekeeping is always there a little bit in the background. I wanted to mention that the um, newsletter, the newsletter is going to be back this month. So I, I write it it comes out once a month, uh, usually on the 14th, around the 14th of the month, every month. It just gives you a really good synopsis of sort of what's going on in the community, what's happening, things that are happening in the background, events, you know, it, it just sort of gives you an idea of what's happening. It includes stuff that is available to everybody, recent blog posts, things that are being published on Patreon that's open to everybody, recent podcast episodes, highlights. It's just a quick read, quick and dirty, lots of links, and just gives you an idea of what's happening. So there's that. You can sign up for the newsletter at wellfordpearls.com. Uh, for the Unbraided, the Art and Science of Spinning Color, the book that Katrina Stewart of Crafty Jack's Boutique, her and I wrote together, um, that is available w using the links in the show notes, which are available again at wellfordpearls.com or at patreon.com slash wellfordpearls. And the links are all down below in the description box here on YouTube. We have had some community participation stuff going on and we've had a giveaway running through August. We always do like a monthly giveaway and then at the first show of the next month, I announce a winner and send out something. Um, we didn't do that last show because I didn't have a chance. We'd just come back from camping and I just hadn't had an opportunity to get everything organized. So for the August episode thread, I had asked you guys what your biggest accomplishment in spinning was. I'd asked you sort of what, what it is that you have been doing recently that um, was, was your biggest accomplishment. Not necessarily your favorite spin, but what's your biggest accomplishment in your spinning and in your yarn making in general. So the winner was post number 24 from the August episode thread on Ravelry. And this is Peregrinea. I hope I'm saying your username correctly. And she says, my biggest accomplishment, I think I have two. First and foremost, having been able to spin for the ghost horses sweater, the sampling, the swatching, calculating, and finally spinning a designated quantity for a de designated weight and ending up with a sweater that I really love. That's wonderful. 
And secondly, being able to spin cotton long draw, both of these things give me confidence. That's awesome. I think one of the things about our spinning that we, as we go through and as we um, learn and f figure out sort of what works for us, the process going through from the beginning to the end, that's the whole purpose of our zero to hero spin along that we have going in the Ravelry group and on the Slack channel sort of indefinitely. We restart it every year just to sort of start fresh, but the idea is to go from a, you know the fiber whatever that is for you all the way through to a finished object and the whole premise of it is to build your confidence and to offer a community of people who are there to support you and to help you through that process because inevitably you're going to have stuff that comes up like what i did this week when i cast on double the number of stitches that i needed and some I, what was I thinking? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. For September, tell us about a blend that you've spun that you didn't expect to be as wonderful as it was or a blend that you're dreaming about spinning. So this might be you were really, you had um, merino flax in your, in your stash and you were wondering what that would be like and what it would be like to spin and you went and spun it and it was amazing. You thought, this is, this is crazy, I didn't think this would be this good. Or you have it in your stash waiting and you're dreaming about spinning it and wondering how it will spin, just as an example. So some sort of a fiber blend. Um, if you could tell us about that in the September episode thread, which is linked down below, or if you would like to leave a comment here on YouTube for those who don't use Ravelry anymore for mostly accessibility issues, um, please don't hesitate to comment below. Uh, here on YouTube and I will include those entries in the random number when we do that in October. So enter here on YouTube and leave a comment below and tell us um, about a, a blend that you've spun that you didn't expect to be as wonderful as it was or a blend that you're dreaming about spinning or you can enter in the episode thread which is again linked below if you're a avid Ravelry user. It was really interesting because I was talking with um, a friend this past week and we were talking about how in the past uh, we used Ravelry a lot for inspiration and we would just cruise through the patterns and use it as sort of this inspiration for all the different things that were available on Ravelry. And we were both saying how we're not really doing that anymore and I think it's twofold. One is there's just so much on Ravelry now and there are so many patterns that they all kind of get lost in the fray. And I find it's really hard to kind of sift through the really popular stuff. And I sort of can't get to some of those patterns that are maybe a little bit overlooked or some of the ones that are by lesser known designers or stuff that I, you know, had an eye on or that I saw on Instagram, bookmarked it on Instagram, and then I go to Ravelry and it's kind of lost in the fray of all this other stuff. And so I've, I've really found that from like a, an inspiration perspective, I don't use Ravelry like I used to. Uh, it's still a very busy place. And so, yeah, I just kind of don't use it like I used to. I have found that I've actually been going back into my favorites from the last number of years, because I've been on Ravelry now for 14, almost 15 years, almost right from the beginning. And over the years, I've favorited a lot of stuff. And so what I do now is when I'm looking for inspiration or I'm looking for something, I actually go through my favorites. And I have found quite a few patterns that I've kind of forgotten about that I'm really excited to make over the next little while. So that's actually been really fun, but I don't use the way that I use Ravelry has, has definitely changed. So that's been really interesting to see and to experience. Uh, and I wonder if that experience has been similar for you, especially for those of you who don't use Ravelry at all anymore and are favoring other platforms. I wonder, I wonder what that experience has been like for you. Book Club is meeting uh, regularly. We meet every other Friday. Uh, so we're, we didn't meet yesterday, we're, but we are meeting this coming Friday. Uh, if you're interested in book club and our Jane Austen uh, book club and also our anti-racism book club, please don't hesitate to reach out in the Slack channel under hashtag books, books, books. So if you would like to be a participant in our uh, Patreon community, you are very much welcome and we hope that you will give us a chance. It's a very supportive, inspiring group and I hope that you find something there that you're looking for. Even if it's just community, sometimes I think it's like, 
you know, do I join something just for the community and just to feel connected? And I've started to really realize that that is a very deep need in many of us, you know, to connect and to feel connected and to be part of something bigger. So if you're looking for other like-minded people who love to make yarn, please don't hesitate to, uh, to, to reach out. So let's talk about my projects. Let's talk about what I'm making and I'll, I'll start off with, with what I finished. So I actually did finish my CVM mohair spin. Uh, this is Small Bird Workshop and this yarn was spun on my Ashford E spinner and I actually took it with me the week that I was away with my mom and the kids and I carried my Ashford, I took the whole bag, I carried it around uh, on my on my shoulder and took it down to the beach every day and it was phenomenal. I was so glad to have it with me. Uh, I used the battery pack and because we have a 12 volt converter in our trailer, because we have a solar panel, I was able to charge it. Dragging my e-spinner around throughout the week was actually really nice for me to be able to reinforce that spinning everywhere and taking our spinning with us is actually really easy to do. And I think sometimes I have like this mental block that my knitting is more portable. And in a lot of ways it is, it's lighter, there are less things to have to take with us. We can have just you know one skein of yarn with a little Ziploc bag and some needles and we're good to go. But with my e-spinner, carrying it with me and forcing myself to remember to keep the battery charged, plug it into the trailer, get the battery charged to do the plying uh, as I finished up the spin, really reinforced for me that we can make quite a lot of yarn in a relatively short period of time. So I had taken the 200 grams with me and of course I left a little bit of it at home after podcasting and chatting with you guys last weekend. I had left that little bit of fiber that was left from the first braid at home. So I had a little bit left to finish off when we got home. But as I had mentioned in last week's episode, it was a long weekend for us and it was easy peasy for me to sit and finish it off and have some quiet time and work on that last little bit of CVM mohair and then ply up what was left on the bobbin that didn't get plied while we were away. So that 200 grams of fiber in less than a week was completely spun. It all got made. And that first skein that I plied while we were away, so I spun all of the singles and then I plied it while we were gone, was about 600 yards of yarn, which is quite a significant amount of spinning. Like if you stop and think about it, that's, you know, 600 yards times two for the singles and then another 600 yards to ply. So it was quite a significant amount of yardage and I was just sitting there on the beach, you know, continuous backward, counting about four counts back, winding it on, four counts back, winding it on. So when I talk about continuous backward draft, what I'm talking about is sort of a worsted style of spinning where I have the singles out in front of me and I'm just drafting backward and smoothing, drafting backward and smoothing, drafting backward and smoothing. And I'm doing that a certain number of times before I'm allowing it to wind onto the wheel. The thing with an e-spinner is that you don't have that ability to sort of speed up and slow down your feet like you do on a treadle wheel or to slow down the spindle or stop the spindle like you do with spindle spinning. The beeping is our oven. So I've got stuff going in the oven. I've got stuff in the bread machine. I've got all these things happening in the house. I've got laundry going. The dishwasher is going. All the things. If I don't blow a circuit, it'll be amazing. So as I'm drafting backward and I'm creating those singles, as I'm winding on with the e-spinner, I've really found that I need to be very consistent about how I'm moving my hands. So as soon as I start to get distracted or I'm finding that I'm holding the singles and allowing the twist to build up because I'm doing something with the fiber or I want to take a sip of something or like anything, I have been really trying to get into the habit of stopping the spinner, stop, just stop stop spinning, stop moving it, stop. <laughs> the reason is because as I'm spinning and I've got all of that stuff building up and all that twist building up and whatnot, I'm really finding that it really affects how my yarns come out because I end up with these over twisted areas as I'm plying and I ended up and then I end up 
inevitably with lower twist areas of the singles as I'm plying. Like I feel it in my fingers because the twist is building up and then I kind of overcompensate by spinning quickly. So drafting quickly and winding on the yarn quickly to sort of dissipate that twist. Does that make sense? As I get distracted with something, taking a sip of water, cup of coffee, whatever it is, I'm really interested in whatever I'm talking about with whomever I'm with. So with my mom, there was a couple of times where I wanted to give her my full attention. I just stopped the spinner. So carrying the e-spinner around and being really intentional all week about making sure that I was pulling it out, that I was using it, that I didn't just bring it with us on our trip and put it into one of the storage compartments in the trailer and just leave it, but actually pulling it out, keeping the charging block close by and plugging it in after I had used it, making sure that the battery pack was full really made a huge difference. And like I said, it really reinforced for me that we can spin a huge amount of yarn in a relatively short period of time. We had talked last week about possibly doing a love note along that I had said because this yarn was that combination of the CVM with the mohair that I thought it would be a really, that might be an option for a pattern. The love note is knit on six millimeter needles. Those are big needles. <laughs> and this yarn is a sport at best. So because it is a little bit more fine gauge and it, it, it doesn't have that poof factor that some of our yarns have because of the type of fiber that it is, like the CVM and certainly not the mohair. They don't, they don't poof like some of our other yarns where if you spin a fingering weight two ply and it's Targi or Polworth or Rambouillet or Cormo and it you wash it and it blooms up to a heavy sport like DK. This yarn is not that yarn. It is way more of a drapey, um, there is a halo. It, it's very much like a long wool type yarn because um, of that mohair poking through. It just has a feel of a more drapey kind of you know, lustrous, rustic yarn. It wouldn't be terrible for the love note. It would actually make a really nice love note if I had spun it a little bit thicker. It's just a little bit too fine to be to be knit into a love note. Uh, love note is a pattern by Tin Can Knits. It's a really popular pattern. It's been knit a bajillion times. I actually am curious to see how many times because it is very popular. And one of the reasons is because it is so wearable. Uh, people have, have, you know, of all body shapes, sizes, ages, stages, male, female, uh, it, it's just a very wearable sweater. And so if you haven't heard of it, I would highly recommend that you look at it. My friend Mari and I had seen a lot of love notes at Knit City this past year, which is a fiber festival that happens here in Vancouver in October every year. Unfortunately, it has been canceled for this year, but they're putting together an online festival that will be a little bit different from previous years for obvious reasons. But the, um, the, the love note is knit with fingering weight yarn, but you hold it together. So you hold it double and knit it on six millimeter needles and you end up with this really drapey open fabric, which is great. However, uh, this yarn held double would be quite heavy. It would be heavier than a fingering weight held double because it's more of like a sport. But to knit it with a sport weight yarn would create, it, it, it would just be too much of an open fabric. It would be too drapey, it would be too holy. And so it's just not a good match for the yarn and the pattern. However, there are a number of people in the community that are currently knitting Tin Can Knits patterns. Uh, Dorothy is knitting the Harvest cardigan. Eve is working on her first flax. Uh, quite a number of people spoke up in the Slack channel and said they would love to knit the Love Note. Uh, I'm not actually saying the Love Note for me is off the table. It's just not with this yarn. And so one of the things that I thought would be really cool going into the fall is because the Tin Can Knits patterns are so diverse and there are so many of them, maybe we should do a Tin Can Knits along. Um, and you guys can, you know, if you're using commercial yarn, jump in. If you're stash busting, jump in. If you're hand spun stash busting, jump in. If you want to spin and knit um, from 
fiber and sort of have a smaller project to do for a zero to hero, let me know. Like, do you wanna do that? And we could just do a Tin Can Knits Along. Their patterns are really popular. There's been 4,900 love notes that have been knit, which is kind of mind boggling. And it's a great pattern. All of their patterns fit a breadth of sizes, shapes, you know, it, their, their patterns are very inclusive and they have really inclusive sizing. So anything from kids and babies to adults to, you know, and everything in between. So if that would resonate with you and that would be something that you guys would be interested in, um, I think I might actually, uh, I was saying this to Eve, I, I think this yarn might actually become a flax light. And wouldn't you know it, I can't find it. <laughs> I'm looking it up to see what the flax light gauge is and what the yarn that is called for is and what the what the yardage is, but it's just not coming up for me here and I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time scrolling to see if I can find it. There are a lot of tin can knits patterns and so I'm sure everybody will find something that they like and enjoy. So I did find the flax light. It's knit with fingering weight yarn on 3.75 millimeter needles. So I would have to, and it is a free pattern here on Ravelry. I would have to do some swatching and kind of see, but that might actually be a really good option for me with this yarn because the yardage requirements for my size is, mm, I don't have that much yarn. Yeah, I'll have to see. I'll keep you guys posted. But if you would be interested in doing a Tin Can Knits along, uh, please let me know. I'll start a thread in Ravelry and we can share our progress and what we're working on. If you're in the Slack channel and you prefer to use that, we can share our progress there. So let me know in the show notes or in the comments associated with this uh, Patreon post. Let me know what you think. That would be a really fun, a really fun along to take us into the fall and into the into the winter. The CVM mohair was really lovely to spin. It was uh, very smooth, it drafted well. I think there was some grease left on the fiber as I was spinning. My hands were quite dirty. Um, after I finished spinning, there was quite a bit of grease on my fingers. The, so while it wasn't super, super clean, the, the sort of the flip side of that was that it drafted really easily. So when you're spinning in the grease, you've got that sort of smoothness of all of that lanolin and that buildup of the grease. It can be a really unpleasant experience, but in this case it was actually okay. And the fibers drafted really beautifully. It didn't it didn't leave any kind of a residue or anything on my wheel. Um, the there were some areas of the fiber where there was a little bit more mohair and it hadn't been blended um, quite as nicely, but overall it was really nice and the finished yarn has a really beautiful heathering quality to it and sort of a rustic quality because the CVM is undyed. The one thing I will say about this yarn is it's probably not next to the skin soft for everybody. Some people would find this a little bit too rustic for their taste, maybe a little bit too toothy. Um, for me, it's fine. And actually, after I scoured it and skeined it, I have found it really softened up. So what I did, what I did basically was I skeined it up on my skein winder. I've ended up with roughly about 900 yards of yarn and I tied it really super well. So I tied it in multiple places around the skein. And then I actually have Unicorn Power Scour that I picked up a few years ago after having some sample packs and I scoured this uh, yarn. So I filled up the sink with a quite a bit of quite warm water not so hot that I could not put my hand in it, but warm so that it would, you know, dissolve that grease and, and get that, that lanolin off of the fibers. And um, I had put the power, the unicorn power scour in ahead of time. I submerged the yarn and I let it sit for about, probably about eight to 10 minutes. I don't think it was quite 10 minutes. And I just let it you know, dissipate. I didn't want the water to cool down and so that that grease would reattach to the yarn. And I pulled it out, wrung it out, tried to get as much of the excess water out as I could. And then I filled up a second sink for a rinse. And so then I submerged the, the yarn in that. Quite warm water again, not hot to burning, but warm. And I sort of moved it around a little bit in there and gave it a really good rinse. 
and then wrung it out and hung it to dry and it has come out beautifully the yarn is beautiful what what bloom there is has come out this isn't a yarn that's going to really poof and fill in the gaps like with like I mentioned so Targi and Cormo and some of those other fibers that are more there's that fine wool that crimp that reactivates that just brings those yarns to life and they just go you know boing, boing. Uh, this yarn is not like that this is more of a drapey yarn this is more of a yarn that's got that halo and sort of got those qualities of a long wool what I really love about these yarns is they have that very rustic quality and when you knit them up into like shawls or um, especially shawls or lacy sweaters uh, they just have that beautiful look to them that just screams to me farm to yarn I'm really really happy with how this yarn turned out I'm not exactly sure what the yardage is like I said but I'm really happy with how it turned out and I'm excited to get into some of the other fibers that I have in my stash that are undyed that are you know from the farm and quite rustic you know toothy farmy I don't know what else to describe it but I'm, I'm glad that I took the time to scour I think if I had only put the yarn into a warm bath with some eucalyn or some soak it wouldn't have come out as clean and as nice but in the end I've ended up with a, just an absolutely beautiful yarn the yarn will make a beautiful lace yarn since it's a two ply and it will open up in those yarn overs if I choose to go that route if I decide to do a small sweater or a garment uh, if it has some lace work in it again it's going to fill you know make those yarn overs really bloom and blossom and open up um, but it's not going to it's not low twist or uh, won't withstand wear and tear but it's not high twist where it's kinky and twisted and high twist and sort of more like what I would think of for like rustic house socks kind of thing so it's just that medium twist yarn right in the middle 35 degree twist angle and just a really lovely medium yarn spun for a little bit of wear and tear but to showcase in lace so my great disaster this week <laughs> was my meadow yarn so this was my meadow imitation that I was working on and that I shared on the wool circle the wool circle is a live stream that we do twice a month and we talk about what I'm spinning we get onto the wheel I answer questions in real time and we talk about what's happening behind the scenes uh, if you're interested in that please check out the wool circle uh, on patreon under uh, patreon.com slash pearls slash join so you're looking for the wool circle if that interests you some behind the scenes some at the scene uh, at the wheel work I've been sharing about this yarn and I was really inspired by a project that Kat from our community was working on and she had to cast on an exorbitant number of stitches for this vest that she wanted to knit and the pattern photo really inspired me and so I went searching for the yarn and looking at the properties of the yarn and wanted to know a little bit more about sort of what what created that aesthetic of this particular garment and what gave it that drape and what the fibers were in in the yarn that was was going to give it this drape for this this particular garment I imitated the fiber uh, I, I reached into my stash and, and you know drum carded up this this great blend using four different fibers so I ended up mixing BFL alpaca uh, Tessa silk and toe flax and I made this yarn and I've talked about it on the podcast before this has been something I've been working on sort of over the last month or so and I skeined it up and I took it with me last week with my mom I figured I'll take the book with me the pattern is in here I'll have a look through the pattern hopefully I'll get a chance to cast on this week and I'll get knitting so that never happened <laughs> it was I I was spinning I took the e-spinner so you know I had other things to do so I was working on all of my CVM mohair so I ended up bringing the two skeins of yarn home and so on Saturday night after our amazing race that we do every year with the cul-de-sac which I talked about last week that we do this amazing race every year with our cul-de-sac friends and we get mixed up and one of the moms sort of puts it on and hosts it she loves doing stuff like that sends us out on these crazy scavenger hunts and it sort of made the best team win so this year because of the covid we had to we did it in family units instead so all of the families were competing against each other 
It was really super fun. It was super exhausting. And then we had dinner afterwards. So normally we would do a big potluck this year. We brought our own food and ate our own food, but we all ate together in the cul-de-sac. And uh, yes, we won. So we, I was sitting there visiting with everybody. We'd eaten our dinner. The kids were playing. They were having an absolute blast. It was a gorgeous evening. Like the sun was setting. It was warm. Everybody was having a great time. Tons of laughter. Wonderful way to end the summer, I have to say. It just gives me goosebumps. I get a little bit emotional talking about it. It's just something that we all really look forward to at the end of the summer. And with everything that we've been through this past year, everything that we're all um, managing and coping with, it was just such a life-giving way to kind of end the summer. So I decided while we're all visiting, I would cast on for this sweater that I want to knit out of this yarn that was the whole purpose of making this yarn in the first place was to make this vest well that was not a good idea that was a very 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 bad idea very very bad idea did I mention it was a bad idea <laughs> it was a really bad idea the reason is because I glanced at the pattern I glanced at my yarn and I glanced at my needles I had already done my gauge swatch so this little book that I've been working on over the basically since June just has all of my different um, swatches and and spinning sort of swatches in here and as I move on to new projects and new new um, uh, ideas and and new things as as the year unfolds I'll move all of this into my binder that has all of this organized that I kind of keep organized year after year after year and the reason is this is smaller it's more portable I can take it with me I can slide swatches into it really easily and keep them clipped in place like this and I can kind of take them with me and it kind of creates like a mini scrapbook that of projects that I'm working on right now in in real time and then I transfer it all into my big binder that keeps things organized year after year so I had dipped my swatch of the original yarn um, before I dyed it and had gotten my my gauge and everything on 3.75 millimeter needles which is what was called for in the pattern and I was a little bit off, but not so off that I couldn't not continue. So I just need to go down um, one needle size from 3.75s to 3.5s and I'm, Bob's your uncle, my gauge is perfect. So I'm knitting away, I've cast on, I'm doing my two, two by two ribbing and this is the Shoreline Vest by Carrie Bostick Hogue. This is out of the Swoon Main book. I've knit this before. It's a pattern that I'm very, very, very familiar with and I just finished the shore cardigan, so very similar in terms of the construction and the way that it's made. And there I am casting it on and I cast on two and a half times the number of stitches. I have no idea where I got the number from. I have no idea why I cast on this many stitches. I don't know what I was thinking of. I have no idea at all. But I cast on like 300 and something stitches. And the pattern calls for less than 200 at my gauge for my size. I'm knitting the uh, 36 inch bust, that whatever that size is. So I don't know what I was thinking. I'm actually wondering if I looked at a different pattern and I thought that I had the right number of stitches and I ended up casting on the wrong, the wrong stitch count, but I can't find anywhere in the book that says cast on 308 stitches. I have no idea. Like even the largest size for the vest doesn't call for 308 stitches. I have no idea what I was doing. So I started working the short rows. I did all of the ribbing. I did, and I was halfway through the short rows and I was like, first of all, this is using way too much yarn. Second of all, this is way too big for the size of my needles because I'm knitting the 36 inch bust so on a 32 inch cable it shouldn't be that much excess fabric and i had like 15 20 inches of excess fabric so i pulled the needles out which sounds really crazy but i knew that i was just so off and that i wouldn't be able to continue anyways so i pulled the needles out and i put it on my dress form and sure enough it wrapped around my dress form one and a half times so the front came across the front of my dress form to the other hip so think like a wrap skirt. And I just thought to myself, like, what, what did I do? So I looked again at the pattern and, and looked at the, the numbers again and looked at the number of stitches that I should have cast on. And of course I was way off. 
so I had um, I had double the number of stitches so I pulled it all out I have reskeined it and I also took the opportunity to figure out my exact grist for this yarn so I figured out the yardage that I have which is 600 yards of yarn and I also um, updated my my grist calculation so in some ways it wasn't terrible it was a lot of wasted time which is a real a real bummer but it wasn't the end of the world in terms of losing so much work it really makes me realize and it reminds me that we have to trust our intuition this is one of those situations where if I hadn't have stopped and I just continued on I probably would have ended up about seven or eight inches into the body of the sweater not paying attention to my my gut and what I was feeling and what I was thinking and really regretting not taking a moment slowing down and realizing that I was probably making a huge mistake and I think that that's one of those situations where you know if we just full steam ahead and don't slow ourselves down we can really make some big mistakes and sometimes whether it's in our spinning and making our yarns when we go to ply or when we're knitting or weaving with our yarns when we're making a warp whatever it is if we're just being really single-minded and putting our blinders on and not paying attention we can really make some big mistakes so lesson learned I have looked at the pattern again I know how many stitches I'm supposed to cast on and I will work on that over the next couple of days and hopefully I'll have a little bit uh, to, of progress to show you next weekend so the final project that I wanted to share with you this week was my Albini cardigan this is a pattern by Orlaine Souche and I have been knitting this out of my Shetland that I've been spinning from Disdaro Ranch that I got from Lori quite a few years ago we've done some giveaways of this Shetland I've got some four ounces currently on its way out to Tamar that was part of the made with love along and I was looking at it as I was packaging it up to send it out to her and I just was struck by just the the rustic nature of this fiber and just how beautiful it is it is such a lovely yarn and it's a real yarny yarn the the yarn that I'm spinning from this fiber so originally I had an entire bump of this fiber it's a huge amount of fiber and I had it in the bag and I kind of had started to spin it and I made a bunch of two ply which I've talked about on the podcast quite a bit and I had also made some three ply and I wasn't super in love with the three ply it wasn't my favorite yarn and I made it quite high twist I did quite a quite a severe twist angle to 45 degrees and it just didn't feel like a great yarn to me but the funny thing is is that it really felt like a rustic sweater yarn to me and I kept coming back to it again and again and again and I've talked about this on the podcast before I was at work early in the parkade had nothing to work on and I decided to cast it on for the sweater which is what I kind of had in the back of my mind and it's been one of my favorite projects to date besides gentle morning by Trin Annalee that project was my it was just a great great sweater that sweater but Albini has ended up being another one that has just all of the pieces have come together and I don't know what it is about those yarns that you make sometimes that just really feel like you nailed it you know you nailed it feels good to work with them it feels good to spin them you sort of don't want the project to end but you kind of do want the project to end because you want to wear said sweater or you want to uh, enjoy knitting with the yarn and you kind of just want all of these pieces to come together all at once this is kind of one of those projects so this is kind of one of those situations where I just have been loving the process and loving this yarn so much and I've been doing what I always say not to do I've been spinning as I've been knitting so one of the reasons is because I have sort of a finite amount of this fiber left and I would like to continue to pass it along and and pay it forward and continue to do some giveaways for you guys and send it out to you guys but I also don't want to have a stash full of three ply Shetland because I would like to use some of that two ply to do something with as well so I'm kind of spinning and knitting spinning and knitting spinning and knitting so the last skein that I finished up that I talked about last week on last week's podcast I got to the end of so I've got this little bit left here this is the end of the current skein and I got quite far down the sweater I was really surprised 
how far down the body of the sweater I got. Uh, I'm about seven or eight inches into the body of the sweater. In the pattern, the sweater is knit to about 13 and a half inches from the underarm. And I would like mine to be a little bit longer than that. I'm thinking more like 15 and a half or 16 inches, just to add a little bit of length, bring the sweater down a little bit further, more along the back of my um, buttock and down past my hip bone. So I'm gonna continue to knit and sort of move the uh, pocket placement as I feel is appropriate. So I'm thinking that the pockets will move down by about two inches and then I'll start the pockets and I'll finish off the hip of the sweater. So as I've been spinning, um, I've been working on my Lendrum DT, so my double treadle um, castle style Lendrum wheel, and I've been spinning a bobbin, filling it up, and then putting it onto the Lazy Kate, grabbing another bobbin, half empty from the previous plying session, filling this up, putting it onto the Lazy Kate, filling up the next bobbin and then plying. And as I go and as I empty off my bobbins and sort of get the yardage that I need and as I spin, I'll end up with a finished sweater quantities of yarn. One of the things that I really don't like about doing it this way and spinning this way is that I end up with all of the yarn spun and it's in the project, but I don't get to take the finished yarn photo, you know? the token finished yarn photo with all of the yarn piled up and I just there's an ins incredible sense of mastery and accomplishment to just being able to spin a sweater's quantity of yarn and having that that journalistic photo that diary of our projects that I really I really enjoy having and it's one of the reasons why I started photographing my projects in the first place and keeping a blog in the first place was to sort of have this ongoing journal of what I was making and what was working and what wasn't working and that's the only thing about making a sweater this way is that as you're spinning you're using up the yarn so I don't know how I feel about it exactly but it's not my favorite way to work I definitely prefer to have all of the yarn first and then I can tailor the project to what I have that said this yarn has been really easy to spin. Again, I'm spinning in sort of a woolen style. So we talked about this before, but I'm not really spinning long draw per se, but it's not really continuous backward per se. It's sort of somewhere in between. So the twist is between my hands. It's between my forward hand and my fiber supply hand. And the twist is running along in here and I'm not smoothing down those singles. But because it's a three ply and the finished yarn is about 14 wraps per inch so a heavy sport light DK and I'm knitting the this on I think it's three three point seven five millimeter needles so a little bit smaller and I have just been really enjoying sort of the woolen nature of this yarn it's a very uh, airy yarn it's not a it's not inconsistent it's actually very consistent I've been quite surprised at how consistent this yarn is but it's got a real airiness to it and a very woolen quality to it and the individual singles in the finished three ply aren't particularly uh, visible so in worsted yarns we tend to be able to see the individual singles very clearly and they tend to be that's one of the reasons why barber pulled yarns or marling yarns really are quite accentuated in a worsted spun yarn because you can really see those two singles that have been plied together and how they twist together in the different color Whereas with woolen yarns, you very much end up with singles that are a little bit more fuzzy. There isn't a clear delineation between the singles. It's a little bit, like I said, fuzzier. And the yarns tend to be, uh, they look more airy. They look a little bit more rustic generally. I really like these yarns. I, I sort of consider them sort of semi-woolen. It's from a woolen prep because it is a pin drafted roving. And so automatically it should be classified as a woolen yarn. But it's not true woolen in the sense that I am not spinning it long draw. I'm sort of spinning it somewhere in between where I'm drafting the fibers and pulling back and sort of allowing the twist to run up and then not smoothing per se, but sort of running my fingers along to move to the next point. But they still are very woolen-esque. So I guess if you were being really dogmatic about classifying yarn, you would say that this was a woolen yarn. It feels like a woolen yarn. It, it's very airy, the, the, the cardigan is very light. 
Uh, it has a it has a, a slightly toothier feel to it, and um, it's got it 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 definitely looks like a farm to yarn type type yarn if you know about yarn and you know how they're sourced so I've been really really happy with how this is coming together I'm really enjoying this knit again like gentle morning it's just a classic cardigan and it's knitting up really quickly so if you have any questions about this project or you want to know more please don't hesitate to ask So I thought we were done and I had shared with you everything that I was working on and then I realized that I had one more thing. I haven't touched my Savile Boleyn sweater and I haven't touched my Poet sweater, but I did swatch for the Florence Tank by Sari Norland and I had bought some lace weight yarn that I have in my stash and this pattern gets you to hold the yarn double. So I held the yarns double for this little swatch and this is an alpaca and mulberry silk blend. It's, it's drops. It's not really anything particularly special but I've had it in my stash for a little bit now and I wanted to work with the yarn. I thought this would be a great pattern. I have not measured my gauge yet and I thought that this was something that I could just work on this fall maybe into the winter to have it ready for next spring summer. Uh, it's a lovely pattern. So far it's very clearly written. Sari's patterns are awesome. I'm really enjoying her poet sweater, although I haven't worked on it recently because of all this other drama. I would highly recommend her patterns as well if you're looking for a new knitwear designer. The last thing that I wanted to share with you is my pink velvet. So my pink velvet I had shared with you last time. I had put it on and I had shown it to you and I was able to actually wear it last Saturday after I finished the live stream with you guys because it was actually quite cool. It was overcast. We were expected to get a windstorm and it was kind of a sweater wearing day. And so I ended up wearing my pink velvet all day. I was constantly tugging at it, constantly, constantly pulling and lengthening it and fitting it. And it's because when you're wearing, um, any kind of a garment especially a pullover you're just moving around and your shoulders lift up and down and your arms lift up and down and it lifts the garment up so if you think that a garment should be x length it's a good idea to kind of keep in the back of your mind that you might want it a, an inch or two longer just to compensate for that movement and that's what happened so as i was wearing it i had said to you guys that i had this little bit of yarn left and i maybe would want to lengthen it and make it a little bit longer and did I do the right thing by casting it off when I did, et cetera, et cetera. So the little bit of yarn that I had left, I could have kept going around, but by then it, the ribbing was getting quite long. I unpicked everything and I re -knit it. So this is what now is left, this little bit of yarn. And I added about an inch and a half to the bottom ribbing. So I haven't um, tied in the ends yet, but I'll include um, some video of this finished sweater and I will weave in the ends before I do that and I've added about an inch and a half to the bottom of the sweater and I think that it'll be a little bit better I think that just that added length and movement and being able to move in the sweater will really help with just the overall feel of the sweater so adding that little bit of, of length last night while James was at tutoring really kind of I think was worth it it was a lot to unpick the tubular bind off but it was worthwhile and in the end I did match the bind off that I had done at the cuff and at the collar where I just did a standard bind off and I ended up matching that on the bottom of the sweater mostly because I sort of thought well if I need to rip it again for some reason or if I want to add a little bit more length a few more rounds I could without having to unpick a tubular bind off so it was kind of in the interest of finishing up and being done sometimes it's okay to take the shortcut <laughs> sometimes it's okay to just get things done so I am off. We are hooking up the trailer and we are leaving um, as we as I as I sort of finish this off. I am going to finish up the editing and I'm going to pop in our co-executive producers at the end of this episode who are supporting the podcast week in week out by supporting at that tier. And uh, I hope that you see your name there. Until next week, happy spinning, happy knitting 
and I hope that you enjoyed this slightly different format to the podcast and I hope that you'll tune in next week for our regular live stream. We will be back to kind of regular scheduled programming next week. And if you're curious about anything that goes on here at Woolen Spinning, or if you're curious about Patreon, or you're wondering about how to get more involved, please don't hesitate to reach out. Rachel at WelfordPearls.com. That's P-U-R-L-S, Pearls.com, like purling the wrong side of the fabric. And I think that's it. So have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and stay safe. I hope that you're settling into your routines wherever you are, whether you're entering the spring or the fall, depending on which part of the world you're in. And until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy dreaming. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.